you ever find yourself looking at other sports photographers and wonder if they came out of the womb 1DX in hand, firing away beautiful images? I know I did. I know I do at times. But actually, in reality, that's not the case. I'd love to say that I, I was born being able to shoot beautiful photographs, but I wasn't. This is something that I've learned and I've made an awful lot of mistakes on the way. In today's video, I've teamed up with some of my favorite YouTubing sports photographers so that we can share our biggest mistakes, our kind of assumptions that we'd made about sports photography that we'd wish we'd known at the time that kind of held us back to start with. If you're interested in finding out more about how to make money from sports photography, then check out my How to Be Successful with Sports Photography course over on Udemy. Links in the description below. I'm really fortunate for this video to have teamed up with David, Mark and Rob, who have all really kindly agreed to share their mistakes and assumptions that they made in the early days. We all do this, we all make assumptions uh, that are often wrong and make easy mistakes because ultimately we don't know any better. It's kind of part of the journey as a creative, but it's really important that as creatives we learn from each other so that we can navigate the potential pitfalls along the way. First up is David with something that we all should have done starting out. David, over to you. So if I had to pick two mistakes that I would correct or avoid if I were to start out right now, uh, actually the first one is quite easy. Just go back further in time and start earlier because I think people have the wrong notion of how long it takes to progress in this field. It's just like real life, it takes time. It takes time to build your portfolio. It takes time to actually go to matches. It takes time to build those connections, those personal relationships that are so, so important to get you to where you want to be, to those events. Uh, the gear progression, that's a separate uh, discussion, I suppose, that will also happen gradually and that's more tied into money than anything else. But here is the time that you need to build a portfolio, the time you need to go to actual events, to learn, to meet people. And that's, that's probably the one thing I would regret the most is not having started earlier. You know, I think that this area that, this era that we're living in, uh, instant gratification, people just needing the likes immediately, the shares, the retweets, the being so dependent on everything being handed to them instantly. Uh, not just in social media, in life really. People have it easy. Uh, some people have it easy um, than others obviously, but it's this notion that things happen overnight, which is not true at all. And in this field, much like any other field, things take time. So if I could talk to myself in the past, I'd say, start now, don't wait, don't wait till tomorrow because it is going to take time. Uh, so yeah, that would be it. Start sooner. This is something I kick myself over all the time. I wish I'd started sooner. I wish I'd picked cameras up when I was at school. I wish that I hadn't have found my thing in kind of the middle of my life, but ultimately I can't go back and change that. So if you're thinking about starting out, just start. Don't wait. There's no point in waiting. There is literally no better time than right now. When we get started out or when we eventually start getting going, we often get held back by the gear. In this tip, Rob shares one of the biggest mistakes that he made kind of getting started with his gear, and it's one that rings true for me too. What's up guys, Rob Sambles here. Ben, thanks for inviting me to get involved in the video. An interesting question that you asked about mistakes when you start out in sports photography. Now, I certainly made a few of those, although I try not to look at them as mistakes. I look at them more as something which I probably didn't know so much back then that I know a hell of a lot better now. And I would like to think that I have improved in both the two bits that I'm gonna talk about today. The first one for me, and something which I think people experience an awful lot when they start out was that I felt I couldn't do the job with the gear that I had and when I started out shooting sports I was using a Canon 7D um, and a really old Sigma lens at the time it was the Sigma 100 to 300 f4 so I was out there with a Canon 7D that isn't great at high ISO levels shooting on an f4 Sigma lens and I was out there trying to shoot youth football at night under floodlights <laughs> 
So let's be honest, some of the image quality and the images that I got was awful. I had grainy images, underexposed images, dark images. But for me, I, I, I felt I was still learning. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. There'll be many people who might have had that similar gear who then wouldn't have gone and shot those photos because they felt they didn't have the gear to be able to do it. And in many ways, they're right. My gear wasn't up to the job. It didn't give me good enough quality images. But at the same time, I was out there and I was taking photos. I was practicing my sports photos. And I learned so much from that. I learned how to work in the worst light with budget gear and it really, really helped me loads. Of course, now I'm lucky enough to be able to shoot with 1DX and various other bits of more expensive gear, but I still learned so much back then and I use all of those skills now. So it helped me out loads and loads. It was a massive learning opportunity. And I'm glad I went out there and I took the photos anyway, even if I didn't have the pro gear to be able to do it. Because so often I think that's something that holds people back. Now, even now I look at other people and I think oh they've got that new 400 f 2.8 lens it's gonna have so much better image quality than mine oh you know that person over there has got the 1dx3 I don't even have the two I'm on the 1dx mark one and, and I could let all those things hold me back but but I think that would be a mistake in itself not just getting stuck in and taking photos it doesn't matter what gear you've got it doesn't matter what level of sports you're shooting get out there and take photos don't make the mistake of hanging back or not getting involved or thinking I'm never going to get a portfolio as good as that guy because he's got access to Premier League and I don't and the best thing I can go shoot is Sunday morning football using my Canon 7D because you know what that's where you start that's where you get those photos in the first place that's where you start building your portfolio it would be a very rare circumstance for a sports photographer to start with two 1DX Mark III's a 402.8 out there on the sidelines of a Premier League game fantastic if someone's managed that but not many people will do they will start out shooting local league sports local events with cheaper budget gear but that's where you would do most of your learning and for me even though I got out there and took photos honestly at the beginning I think I probably spent too much time focusing on the gear and not enough time just getting stuck in and taking more photos so I think that is a massive learning curve from me since I first started out take these images for example they're all from the 2015 British Touring Car Championships and I shot all of these images on my Canon Red Bull and my Sigma 18 to 200 mil lens. You don't need thousands of pounds worth of gear just to get started. Just start practicing and you'll be away. A huge part of what we do is storytelling in sports photography. Let's bring Mark in now and he talks about something that's been invaluable to his storytelling as a photographer. Hi Ben, thanks for inviting me onto this video. Appreciate that. Well, mistakes. Um, or what I say, how I've improved. Um, and the first one would be research and keeping an eye on possible stories that you could probably grab an image for when you go to the game. As you know, I photograph uh, sort of eight, ten months of the year. It's football, sort of lucky enough to uh, photograph Premier League and Championship. So um, now uh, I'll always keep an eye on. I listen to Talk Sport a lot. Uh, Sky Sports News, um, keep an eye online, Mail Online, Mirror Sport, they've all got their own sports sections. And you never know, there might be an injury through training. Um, quite often, players that are injured still arrive at the game and watch the game. And if you know that there's been a player injured during the week, you can keep an eye out for him, you know, arriving at the ground on the Saturday morning. Um, when I first started, this this was the mistake that I made. I would just go straight to the, get, straight to the ground a couple of hours early, get myself prepared, shoot the action and go back. And then it wasn't until I was sat in a press room one morning and uh, I heard one of the guys say, I'm just going to nip outside and see if, I can't remember who it was now, see if so-and-so is going to turn up. He got injured this week and I thought, I'm missing a trick here. That could be quite a big story and I didn't know to go outside. So I always do a bit of research now. It could be a manager story, you know, so a manager might be on the verge of getting the sack. So, you, you know, you know then that when you go to the game, you want to get as much stuff as, you know, as many images of that manager as you can. Um, you know, even through the game, keep an eye on the manager. You know, if he's had a bad week or, you know, a bust up with a player, you know, just getting him and the player coming off the coach together, perhaps, you know, that could be another story. And it does help you. It gives you a bit of a list of what you can possibly grab 
before the game or during the game that can be an extra story without without photographing any of the action you know so yeah that would be my first improvement would definitely be research before your game you know with leading up to the game two or three days or whatever keep your eye on the news because there might just be something that's going on that you're not that you, you weren't aware of and it, it can possibly get you a good use you know so yeah thanks mark there's one thing that all of us as photographers when we first start out kind of fear and we really shouldn't do. What Rob's gonna talk about now is that one thing that as sports photographers and as photographers in general, we should all start to master and get used to and get comfortable with. Back to you, Rob. The second thing that I think I didn't kind of get on board with enough early on, and I wish I had, was that I was a little bit scared of shooting manual. Now that's something that loads of people have. Manual photography is something that can be a little bit scary, right? People start out using the various automatic modes, and I certainly did that as well. When I was shooting sports to start with, I would shoot everything in the aperture priority mode. My thought process for that at the time was then at least I could control my aperture to be as low because I wanted it to be as low as I could get it, 2.8 if I could, or f4 at the time if I was using my Sigma lens. And then I would just adjust the ISO level to make sure it was high enough that I was getting quick enough shutter speeds. The trouble is, of course, with that is it changes all the time and sometimes you don't notice. Your lighting conditions could change a little bit. Suddenly your shutter speed has dropped to 1 400th of a second in order to get the exposure right. You don't notice and then you've got a blurry image and you've got too much movement in your photo. But even then, my solution to that at the time was just to watch it more often and keep an eye on it and make sure if it was dropping, I would adjust the ISO level to get that shutter speed back up. And I think that was a mistake. If I'd invested a little bit more time and had a bit more confidence just to get stuck into fully manual mode earlier, it would have helped me much, much quicker. Now I'm at a stage where I shoot pretty much all of my sports, maybe apart from some circumstances, but pretty much everything in full manual mode. I make sure I've got my settings right. I make sure my dial in the exposure. And that gives me a load of advantages. The biggest one of that is that the camera isn't doing any of the guesswork for you. It's not trying to make a decision for you. Like, oh, should I expose? for the person in the photo or should I expose for that big bright sky in the background you control that you take your test shot you look at it do I need to you know, increase the exposure decrease the exposure increase the shutter speed increase the ISO you're controlling all of that so that you make sure you get the exposure on the subject that you want to be exposed correctly now sometimes when we're out there shooting sports that does mean we have to make some tough decisions do we want that sky slightly overexposed do we want it slightly underexposed uh, but at least then we're making those decisions the camera isn't making them for us and leaving you with funny images where you get like something too dark in the foreground because you had a floodlight in the background that was in your frame and the camera was doing a bit of guesswork for you and leaving the subject of your photo too underexposed as a result i used to get stuff like that all the time when i started out and the fact that i now shoot fully manual mode means i've got so much more control and i can dial in that exposure just right to where i want it to be now i think the barrier for me at the time and for a lot of other people is that there's so much work and it's so complicated to learn manual photography and actually is not and I've talked about this before on my channel it, it's relatively easy if you just get your head around the three variables the shutter speed the aperture and the ISO level and how the three of them work together each of those individually will either make an image lighter or darker depending on where you move it and then they work together as a three and once you get your head around that it makes it so much easier to understand manual photography and start to get it right. Once I made that decision to commit to that fully, my photography improved rapidly from that point onwards. And I really, really recommend that to anybody who's starting out. Learn manual sooner rather than later. That doesn't mean you have to abandon your automatic modes completely. If you want to, for a bit of confidence, use the aperture priority mode or a shutter priority mode, you can. I'm certainly not one to dictate you should never touch those. And are oh, you, you're not a proper photography if you do, because that's total rubbish. Use the automatic modes if it helps you out. But at the same time, make sure you master the manual mode of your camera because it will help you out so, so much. Thanks for getting me involved, Ben. Really enjoyed it. Catch up with you soon. Even though I don't shoot much live action on manual, basically because my brain doesn't work that fast. I do shoot all my commercial sports photography work and any studio and client work away from action in manual. Understanding how it all works together is a really vital skill to getting better images. I've talked recently about being engrossed in the action and missing the bigger picture that's going on around you. Let's go back to Mark as he talks about a mistake that all of us make when we first start out. The second, um 
again, sort of similar, similar really. Um, again, I used to go to the games and whatever, and uh, obviously I do a bit of athletics and cricket, and I would shoot the action, keep my eye on the action all through the game. You think you've got a good set, and then you look at the news, the stories that come out the following day, and something's happened away from the action. And that would be my second tip. Always keep an eye out for what's going on away from the action. It might be something, there might be a couple of managers on the dugout having a bit of a bust up. That could end up being a big story. I mean, quite often I've, I've photographed Jose Mourinho. He is always in the news, as you know. Um, you know, so any Tottenham games, I'll always keep an eye on Jose Mourinho on the bench whether it's a reaction, dejection, celebration. Because nine times out of ten, I mean, I've seen it before, where a Tottenham game has been covered, and the main image is Jose Mourinho. You know, Tottenham may have won or may have lost, but they haven't got the opposition goal. They've got Jose Mourinho with his head in his hands. So, yeah, always keep an eye away from the action if you can. And again, you know, there might be a bad foul on the pitch, and the, the player that's committed the foul, they often wander off, don't they? So always keep an eye on him, because often, if you're looking at the player that's laying down on the pitch, and the other player's wandered off, the referee will go, obviously give him a yellow or a red card, and if you're on the player, you've missed the red card, and that could be the big story. So yeah, always keep an eye on what's happening, away from the action would be my tip. Um, again, fans, you know, opposition, uh, away fans and home fans, when they're obviously close together, they often have a bit of a, a ruckus in, in the crowd. You know, that's something to keep an eye on. Fans' reactions, you know, some papers often use a fan's reaction, you know, dejection or, or celebration uh, with a story. So you always keep an eye on the fans as well. Again, away from the action. So... Uh, I've missed an awful lot of story images in my career, especially when I first started out, because I didn't keep my eyes open to everything that was going on around me. And while you can't photograph everything for everyone all the time, being mindful of what's happening around you and the bigger story that's unfolding is a really important skill to have. Up last, but by no means least, is our second tip, if you want, from David. And that's for those sports photographers who want to take their work and their photos to that level that isn't quite a hobby anymore. One would be learning to accept, to hear the word no. That's just going to happen time and time again when you're starting out. Uh, and it's frustrating, obviously nobody likes to hear no, but it's just part of the game. So the sooner you accept that, the faster you, you'll progress. And sometimes hearing the, the word no, can actually be a, a good a good thing because it makes you think why do these people tell me no then you start to analyze yourself and maybe you know maybe my portfolio is not as strong or maybe i need to connect to the right people to get into this event whatever the reason may be hearing no is just part of the process so those would be the two things i would suggest um, those two tips for new uh, people starting in photography. Any type of photography, not just sports photography. If you want to make this uh, a living or want to be serious about it, start now and get ready to hear the word no. I've lost track of the amount of times that I heard no from potential clients. You can't be all things to everyone, so it's super important to learn to get used to hearing the word no, being able to take it, move on, and approach that next client. So there you have it, six amazing tips from three really, really good sports photographers. My hope is that you take away from this some pointers and some tips that will help you to take one, better photos, two, enjoy more about what you're doing, and three, be able to shoot the sports you love in the way that you love them. Thank you so much guys for getting involved and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with everybody here on my channel. I do really, really appreciate it. If you haven't already, there's links in the descriptions to give these guys a like on their latest videos or even a subscribe. I know they would appreciate it very much. Till next time. If you haven't already, take a moment to hit subscribe so you'll get notified whenever I post up new videos. At the minute, it's about twice a week. I share most of my work on Instagram too, at Ben Snapstuff, so feel free to give me a follow.